So the topic is scale. Um, I thought I'd use an analogy with how are we going to transform American healthcare. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out first to Gary Slutkin, former resident, co-resident of mine, and Arkel Georgia, a former colleague of mine. This is like oh, home week. But um, I thought I'd use the analogy with David, Michelangelo's David, one of the great masterpieces in Western art, and to get a mindset or a picture for you of what American healthcare could be. Certainly not what it is now, um, but uh, in terms of the, the science, the technology, the resources we have available, to see if we could build together a, transform, a transformed American healthcare system that would be truly a masterpiece. So when you think about this, this is a, a little bit of analogy stretch, but you think about David and you think about the, 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 the sculpture that it is, and you think of the American healthcare system and the block of marble that represents the totality of the American healthcare system, and you realize that the waste or the discarded uh, piece of marble accounts for about a third of the two and a half. $2.7 trillion spent every year on healthcare. So the question is, what, what can we do to mitigate that waste? How, how can we reduce that waste, that duplication, the unnecessary services, the unwarranted variation, the inconsistencies in the practice of medicine? And at the same time, not only mitigate the waste, the duplication, the unwarranted variation, but actually build a better um, healthcare system. We know that this uh, one third of the American healthcare system and the spent expense that goes into this waste is reflected in this pie chart with unnecessary services, you know, in inefficiently delivered services, uh, high costs uh, that uh, uh, vary from the norm, excessive administrative costs, fraud, and, and missed uh, opportunities for prevention. One thing I want to uh, really highlight is the fact that to build a transformed American healthcare system, we actually need a degree and a level of collaboration that is unprecedented. We cannot simply, in, we cannot simply confront the challenges that we face today, the challenges around technology, the challenges around healthcare cost inflation, the challenges around unwarranted variation, the challenges around disparities in healthcare uh, based on different populations getting unequal care and service. We cannot face those types of challenges with the same type of answers or would-be solutions from a previous era. We actually need a degree of collaboration that is unprecedented. And here I put out the plan sponsors as one part of the statue, consumers, care providers, and of course, um, uh, health plans uh, like United Healthcare, and coming together, I just wanted to give you a sense of the scale. Plan sponsors, you know, whether they're employers, um, government, uh, business, the military, labor unions, and so forth. The, our, our, my company has over quarter million plan sponsors alone. We talked about 38 million members, uh, actually, you know, approximately 40 million consumers, with coming through different insurance products: commercial, Medicare, Medicaid the military and veterans, and we have over 750,000 contracted care providers, physicians, hospitals, um, therapists, counselors, and so forth, dentists, pharmacists. So this is, this is a, a question that we ask ourselves. If we can begin to provide enduring solutions in terms of this health system transformation I was alluding to at United Healthcare, maybe we can have some sort of indirect uh, or in fact direct impact on changing the entire country's uh, delivery system. And we want to do that with three major levers, and data and analytics, enabling tools, and reinforcers to sustain those types of changes. So first on analytics, I'm going to go uh, quite briefly through a lot of different tools because I just wanted to give you a flavor. This is a uh, a heat map, a different kind of heat map than the epidemiological heat map that Dr. Slutkin talked about. But this is a heat map looking at aggregated claims data. And this is a sample heat map uh, for, from a real employer, a plan sponsor, and uh, basically talks about what, where uh, the uh, proportion of healthcare spend is being um, 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 distributed on an annual basis and what the change is year over year. 
So this talks about preventive services, cardiovascular disease, um, uh, musculoskeletal disease, diabetes, and so forth. And when you, the size of the, the size of the rectangle is proportional to the amount of spend in that particular plan sponsor. And the shade of that uh, color uh, of that uh, rectangle talks about the degree of change year over year. So what this shows at a glance, and it, and it goes on the, on, on the, the um, right-hand side of the, of the iPad pictorial is all the different categories of spend. And the darkest lower left-hand rectangle is diabetes. So if you look at diabetes and you see on a, a, a per member per month basis, the spend of this particular employer, $27.65. But what was most remarkable that it, um, expenses increased $4.18 on a year over year basis. So how can we use data and analytics? We start with this heat map and we drill down and we develop this spider gram um, web based uh, uh, um, measure that measures what care could be versus care that currently is and look at the gap in that. You can see in diabetes, which is in the lower right-hand cor uh, uh, right corner of the web, if you will, pertains to the bar graph on the top right-hand, which says there's a disparities and only about 35, 40% of all opportunities are being covered or being met in terms of the services that should be provided, such as um, eye exams or foot exams and uh, blood testing and so forth. And, what we, and we can drill into each of these decision points to see where, not only where are there gaps in care, but with a plan sponsor that might be across multiple states, uh, which, um, which factory or which facility or which concentration of employees has uh, the, the variation or the best or the worst performance in managing, uh, in this case, uh, patients with diabetes. So this is an important uh, schema. This is showing the sites and showing the, the wide variation that exists in the various facilities where this employer uh, has, um, has uh, associates and colleagues working. Then we want to use the analytics um, even further down at the consumer level. So that was at the plan sponsor level. We want to see, what, let's understand the overall population that um, is being, uh, that this plan sponsor is uh, um, providing medical insurance benefits for. We want to kind of hone in on how do we stratify this population, how we can help this population achieve better health outcomes. So we focus on, on Arthur Johnson, one of the people in the crowd there. And with Arthur Johnson, we can be able to look at aggregated claims data, pharmacy claims, medical claims. We can actually look at health, health risk assessment surveys and so forth and begin to look at what his, in this case, condition with diabetes, high blood pressure, and pneumonia, and what his treatments have been. And furthermore, we can actually look on online for a nurse call center that can tell us, based on the claims data that we've seen from his pharmacy claims, his medical claims, and so forth, uh, if, he's, um, if he's on the right medication, if he's gotten the right periodic um, health visits, and whether he's seeing the right provider. And by right for provider, I mean using our analytical tool, we also have transparency tools that can actually show the providers that have the highest quality and most cost-effective use of resources in managing people with diabetes. And we can actually inform, in this case, Arthur Johnson, uh, where he might have opportunities for improving his own individual health status. The, and to um, Dr. Giorgio's uh, earlier point um, about media, we want to make sure we can develop this type of analytical tool through multiple channels whether they're through the health portal, somebody's internet savvy, or through um, a mail newsletter, healthy notes, uh, mobile apps. We, I'm gonna have a, a, another slide later on about the mobile apps and basically linking, um, in this case, his health status, his uh, summary of claims data, his gaps in care, his provider selection, his provider choices, actually even further, his balance in his health savings account and so forth on a mobile app that could be on his smartphone, uh, as well as through telephonic nurse, old-fashioned you know, telephone calls. I'm doing a little pause and re, uh, reset because one of the things I really want to, I like about the analytics section that I'm speaking on is a collaboration that we just entered, we're very excited about, with Mayo Clinic. 
uh, United Healthcare uh, and United Health Group, uh, through its Optum Labs agency, has formed this collaborative with the Mayo Clinic, where the collaborative is sharing uh, data from the Mayo Clinic as a obviously renowned research and academic clinical institution with United Health Care and the data within Optum to basically have a research collaborative where we can focus on helping to transform the American health system together. It's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, and its focus is going to be on improving the care, the outcomes, and the per capita cost of healthcare delivery. So going further in terms of the uh, consumer, now we move to the provider, the use of analytics for providers. A diabetes registry is just one example of how we can begin to, again, use claims data. Actually, we've uh, developed uh, software now where we can take data from electronic medical records, so it's clinical data, supplementing the claims data to look and track all patients with diabetes. In this case, say, uh, at a particular doctor's practice to see where and how uh, the uh, care is varying by patients with diabetes. And this is the list on a roster or a registry of all those patients. And within that registry, we can see on Arthur Johnson again, that Arthur Johnson has certain vital signs and when his last visits were, what his risks are on a predictive modeling to see what his risk for um, hospitalization may be, uh, where there may be gaps in care that could be and should be closed. So here you see a symmetrical um, and a recipro reciprocal sharing of data, both at the consumer level, at the patient level, Mr. Johnson, and with his physician. Um, both of them aligned to get the same objectives of appropriate care and improved outcomes for Arthur Johnson. Another enabling tool, so that's the data and analytics, and this is the technology section. So again, we can use enabling tools to help consumers. And so in apart from the data and analytics, what are the vehicles to share the data and analytics? So this is the mobile app, Health For Me. You can download this. Um, uh, after you download some of the other uh, apps that uh, Arkel told you about. And you can look at the, and these are the types of functions you can see on the right hand side on the mobile app if you're a United Healthcare member. Urgent uh, care and e emergency room searches, uh, electron, you can get your electronic ID card so you don't have to always look for the paper or the laminated card. Um, you can call a number for the nurse line, so obviously on your smartphone. There's a GPS enabled physician search. The physician search is based on quality and efficiency measurements that we also have behind that. You can review your current claim status, your benefits, your de uh, what's left in your deductible, what's left in your health savings account uh, in terms of the account balance. If you've taken the time to complete a personal health record, it's in there too. On the, um, and the health cost estimator is our latest feature. And that right now, um, in addition to a general transparency report where you can actually um, look at the quality and efficiency across most physicians, uh, we also have condition-specific transparency. So if you're in the Minneapolis area and you want to look for, well, Minneapolis is a little difficult because we don't operate uh, ourselves there, but say you can take Minneapolis as an example and you want to look for colonoscopy you can look at the quality and cost choices for colonoscopy that may impact the consumer in terms of the out-of-pocket spend. And we have that for over 200 different care pathways, office visits, lab, x-ray, um, uh, 30 or 40 most common surgical procedures like hysterectomy, like uh, low back pain uh, surgery, hip and knee replacement, and so forth. So this is the Health For Me mobile app. We also have a similar tool uh, for physicians, uh, basically gives them an idea of uh, looking at their practice patterns, where there might be gaps in care for patients with different conditions, including diabetes, but not limited to diabetes, and to say how they compare with other similar clinics with the same population or in the same geographic area. And that's the one thing that physicians, even the, the most data-driven, the most um, uh, evidence-based physician doesn't have. They don't have comparative data with how they might rank with others in terms of quality, uh, service, or cost efficiency. This is Rasmussen family practice, again, showing them how they profile at the individual physician level within a practice uh, in terms of preventive services, uh, 
uh, care for chronic disease, and so forth. Then finally, the last enabler is about incentives, and we are strong believers in incentives. It's not the only tool, but it's one of the tools, along with information, uh, along with uh, uh, guidelines and programs, uh, to basically begin to incent providers and consumers on achieving healthier um, outcomes. So this is just a schema, schemata that looks from fee-for-service in the lower left-hand corner to capitation with performance-based contracting where we take physicians, providers, hospitals, medical groups, ACOs, wherever they're at, because not all of them are going to be ready for capitation, but wherever they're at, we're going to take where they are starting from and as they increase their level of financial accountability and as they uh, increase their degree of responsibility for clinical outcomes, we begin to reward them on value and to break away from the, the shackles of uh, rewarding on volume over time. And so this is a very incremental approach. It also is a very realistic approach because not every physician, hospital, medical group is ready for, um, um, for capitation or risk sharing uh, types of arrangements. Conversely, also this is just a dashboard that we can provide on a quarterly basis, we're going to monthly basis, that we gives them the report about how they're doing on their value-based incentives. Similarly, we have uh, employee-based uh, incentives too. So we took it as an example, and this has also helped plan sponsors of using data, and this is the United Health Group Personal Rewards Program, which is our health plan that we have uh, as employees of United Health Group. And this is basically uh, a program where we are incented, each of us, myself included, are incented uh, by um, having discounts on our premium that we pay every year if we can establish success in either managing uh, or controlling four major critical uh, health uh, intermediate outcomes, the body mass index, the blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and blood sugar. And even if you don't control it, as long as you're enrolled in a health coach experience, you actually get the full credit. And that is uh, worth up to $600 per person per year or $1,200 per family. So we've had tremendous success, significant participation, well over 85% participation rates, a lot of awareness of risk, and actually the vast majority of people have earned at least one, uh, as an incentive on at least one of these categories. This is just one of the summary graphs on this. This shows two lines, uh, basically, where the, the overall industry reported uh, comparative health plan data in terms of medical trend you can see the trend has gone down from 14% in 2005 to 6.6% in 2011. However, the lower line uh, is United Healthcare, or United Health Group, I'm sorry, which started at about 5%, has gone down to a medical cost trend of 5 tenths of 1%. So in terms of compare, and then we have uh, major uh, improvements in, in, um, in uh, satisfaction, incentives being paid out, and, um, and healthcare results as well. So I just wanted to summarize, in terms of getting to scale, what we feel is that in order to have a transformed health system, we need um, programs like evolved care management programs. We need technology like mobile apps. We need data and analytics, commonly referred to as big data. We need new incentive programs. We need trans, um, uh, transparency and report cards to both consumers and providers. But I would submit that each of those levers by themselves is necessary but insufficient, inadequate, uh, ineffective by themselves to reach the, truly, uh, the true masterpiece that we're all trying to strive for. And together, and, and with the degree of collaboration with consumers, plan sponsors, and providers, uh, I think we can get there. So I think that's my last slide, and then we end up with the masterpiece. So thank you very much, and um, happy to engage in the dialogue. So um, I hope you don't mind. Um, I want to ask you some tough questions, not interrogation style, but I think you know, in many ways we are so fortunate to have you here because a lot of the big ideas that sort of kick around in your head at a conference like this, it, you often say to yourself, well, the person to really ask that question to is someone like you. Um, 
So let me just start with a couple of things. This will feel a little random, but, uh, but I, I think you'll, you'll get where I'm going here. Let's talk first about a slide which uh, we saw yesterday, which described, and it was something that was reiterated by a couple of presenters today, that, that among the things people fear most in the whole healthcare experience is the cost. That, that they fear disease, they fear death and dying, they fear pain, they fear all kinds of things, but, but really the sort of decision point question often is determined by their fear of cost, which means that your business is right in the fear zone, right? I mean, the, the, when people think to themselves, wow, this is gonna be way too expensive, their paralysis about acting comes right at the point where your business gets involved. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that, that you are predisposed to have a client base that is inclined to fear interactions, not necessarily with you personally, but with the, 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 the people who are at the front end of your business? How do you deal with that? I think that's a very fair question. I, I, you know, it's, I'll answer it in one way. So my background is a family physician at San Francisco General Hospital and in public health. Um, obviously, you come with a clinical perspective. All of us, all of us come with an approach to say how you can improve the individual's health outcomes as, as well as the population's health outcome. My, my approach is that up until probably five years ago, the fear of cost was probably latent. It was relatively suppressed um, for whatever reason. Um, you could say that plan sponsors covered 80 to 90% of the healthcare cost bill, whether it's a private employer or a government funded program, Medicare or Medicaid. You could say it was uh, maybe the fact that uh, uh, healthcare costs as a percentage of GDP or percent, percentage of individual uh, wallet share was more manageable. Uh, you could say that the economy was a little stronger uh, than, it, uh, than it has been over the last fi that. five years, yeah. so that the discretionary income was a little bit more flexible. For whatever reason, um, the issues of cost uh, were relatively suppressed. And so what I say now is it's, uh, it's important to achieve all three of the so-called triple aims of better care, better health, and lower costs. That in fact, it is imperative to sustain affordable health care and affordable health insurance, it's absolutely imperative to be responsible about costs, whether it's preventing uh, illnesses um, from reaching complications or, or, or um, uh, disease states before they get too costly, or doing more prevention related to wellness activities, uh, or yes, in fact, being mindful of um, things like a generic substitution for pharmacy so that you can actually provide more affordable solutions than the fact that they're I think we've seen it in the provider community as well, by the way. I think five years ago, it was very difficult to talk about cost management without getting a lot of blowback from the provider community. And now providers, most of them are saying, yeah, we need to be more mindful. We need to be more, um, uh, we need to be better stewards of the shrinking healthcare dollar. So our point is to try to provide solutions around costs. I, that's a, a slightly macro answer, but from the consumer, perspective, it's an acceptable answer, but from the consumer perspective, how do you reassure on an individual basis? What is the corporate message to the consumer which says something like, don't worry, we're going to get through this, or you're going to be able to afford this. I know what you've heard. We understand you come to the table with a lot of fear. Here are the yeah. tools for you to analyze whether you can actually afford this versus hanging up the phone and going and being diabetes non-compliant. Right. No, very good. So at the micro level, the individual patient, level, first of all, what are their choices? Do they really need to go to the emergency room? Do they really need that MRI for a headache that's been there for a couple of hours? Do they really need antibiotics for some uh, with their child with a sore throat? Do they, first of all, is it clinically appropriate for what they're asking for? Secondly, we can give them, as we tried to show it with the transparency reports and the, uh, and the mobile apps and so forth, lower cost alternatives. So what are different tips or, or in the, on the health and wellness and newsletter that we send out online? You know, what are the lower cost alternatives to any number of diagnostic or therapeutic uh, test. I'll give you one quick example because it's uh, been in the news uh, recently. Uh, sleep apnea. There's a what people feel is an uh, epidemic of sleep apnea uh, related to smoking, related to obesity, related to a number of factors. But the, the 
not everybody needs a sleep apnea study test. But if they do have significant symptoms, should they get the test in a certified licensed lab, which is the historical way of getting it, which is $3,000, or should they get it at home with, uh, with devices that have been FDA approved and CMS approved that are just as good for 90% of the patients? That costs $300. To have that kind of candid discussion, we're going to get through this. We're going to make sure that the treatment that you're getting or the, uh, the tests that are being ordered are absolutely indicated, and then we're going to find you the lowest cost comparable alternative. Another one is the BRCA testing with Angelina Jolie. Very courageous for her to come out about breast cancer and a double mastectomy, as well as uh, speaking about an ophorectomy later on. Well, she was definitely at risk. She should have a BRCA test. She's got first-degree siblings and family members with breast cancer. Uh, it's, a, it's a crucial high-risk factor. Most women don't need a BRCA test. They're, they don't follow. They don't fall into the genetic profile, and so you can save yourself three thousand, thirty-five hundred dollars a test. So those are the kinds of examples where you say, "Hey, what? What are the medical indications for a particular test, service, treatment, and uh, what are the lowest cost alternatives?" And we try to do that. As you develop and design. Uh uh, front-end apps for people to ask simple questions about their health and to try to figure out if they need one kind of treatment or another or if they need to alter their behaviors in one way or another. Um, are you constrained in recruiting consumers to be more of a partner, both in terms of the design of their own health care, their awareness information, and in paying for parts of it, which they're going to be doing, um, because there's such a sense of mistrust out there. Oh, I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to just palm all the cost off on me. Does that make it difficult for you to create real partnerships? I think it's a challenge. I think it's a, and that's one of the reasons, many reasons to collaborate with, with, for, with consumers. First of all, in all of our apps, all of our, we have tons of market research. We have lots of consumer uh, advisory consoles on that. Judy Hibbert's a speaker at this forum, which she's been a, a wonderful advisor. Um, I, I'd be, um, unrealistic to say that it wasn't a constraint. On the other hand, collaborating with consumers, collaborating with providers, um, working with plan sponsors, working together to try and get the best outcome, both in terms of quality uh, and as well as cost, is absolutely critical. Um, two more questions. I talked at the very beginning of, of uh, today's session about creating communities that were hypochondriacs. Uh, not individuals, but communities that actually were really concerned and aware of each other's health and were exchanging lots and lots of information. Um, in, in a time of cost control, um, can we think of healthcare systems like United Healthcare Group as a company that enables people to ask questions about, hey, what's going on over here? And and I, I saw my neighbor had something like this, and, and uh, can you answer this question for me? Or do the lawyers kind of shut this down? Do you want that kind of information flowing in? Do you want a community of hypochondriacs asking you lots and lots of questions and, and sharing that as a kind of a community experience, or does that terrify you? I have to take that under legal counsel. No, just kidding. Yeah. No, that was your joke. Yeah. You're not the only. Yeah. No, I th we welcome that. I think the biggest macro uh, point that I can make about United Healthcare, healthcare in general, is finally, it's, I think it's the last sector of society to be consumer driven. And healthcare has to be consumer driven. We have to kind of turn the hierarchy of decision making uh, upside down. And uh, so yes, we would welcome that kind of community engagement, the community uh, of uh, consumer first, uh, to, to tailor our whole delivery system, the information that we share, the, the way we write the um, certificate of coverage, the way we answer phones, the way the access, 24 seven access, the, the ability to um, um, uh, tap into mobile apps. I think we just need to hmm. have more and more patient-centered communities. Last question. Um, did you see the uh, Gary Slutkin presentation yeah. about the uh, violence and the violence interrupters? Yeah, it was great. Take me into a meeting at United Healthcare Group where you, Dr. Ho, pitch, I think we should reimburse for uh, D Reverend Tim's services as a violence interrupter because I'm buying this infectious disease metaphor on violence in our communities. Could you have that meeting? Could you make yeah, that pitch? We could have that meeting. It would be, it'd be very uh, challenging, uh, but I think the epidemiology, the kind of violence as a, as a 
contagious disease is a, is a wonderful discussion to have. We are actually um, working. But you probably would have to have the discussion without going contagious disease. You probably we would have, have that too. Yeah. We, we could have that. It would be hard hitting. Uh, we have uh, several pilots going on now where we would be, we, we are reimbursing peer coaches, lay coaches in uh, underserved communities to work uh, on a peer basis with patients with chronic diseases because the medical establishment has obviously been somewhat um, um, uh, lacking in its access and its understandability, its translation and its effectiveness. Um, so the idea of having violence interrupters as another type of peer coach or lay coach to help them uh, achieve better outcomes would be certainly is something that right up our alley. Thank you so much. Thanks really so much. appreciate your candor. Thank Terrific. You. Thanks, Thanks a lot.